Hey guys, that's Joe, and I uh, hope everyone's doing well. Sorry, a couple of minutes late, and uh, well, we've got another great session lined up today. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, contractors and uh, how to uh, work with contractors, find contractors, and get the best out of contractors so that uh, your project is a resounding success, as they say. So the title of today's session is uh, Chaos to Beauty, Contractors Unmasked, Mastering Real Estate Renovations. And uh, we're going to go into quite a bit of detail. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have enough time uh, to go into the level of detail, which uh, I know many of you would want. But uh, I'll try to um, you know, cover a lot of stuff. And uh, I'm trying to get uh, the live stream in about 30 minutes. So I'll do about 15, 20 minutes of conversation. And uh, and then we'll uh, do a QA. and a So we've got Q&A towards uh, you know, around 7.15, 7.20s and so on. So uh, before I get too far, I'll just let you know that I do have a live event uh, on Saturday, this Saturday, uh, July, the June the 17th at um, between 11 and 1 a.m. Uh, 11 a.m. and 1 p.m. Uh, if you're in the Washington, D.C. area, uh, it's a free event and it's going to be one of my properties. So if you want to kind of network uh, with me, uh, meet, meet with other like-minded real estate investors and uh, just kind of catch up. I haven't done this for a little while. Uh, you can uh, get more information at my uh, by email me joe at joeassamoa.com. You can see a little scrolling, uh, joe at joeassamoa.com, and uh, where you can get a ticket. Uh, it's invitation only. I think there's a few more tickets left, I'm not too sure, but uh, shoot me an email, I'll send you the link, and you can sign up and register there. And invitation only, so you must have an invite in order to attend. Okay, so let's get going. So uh, we're going to talk about, as I said before, the title here is, uh, you know, all the things associated with uh, contractors. You know, the goal here is that, uh, you know, you plan a house and uh, you're excited. You want to get this job done. And uh, but, uh, you know, you want to do it right. And so uh, we all know the stories about contractors. Again, let me just do a disclaimer. There are a lot of good contractors out here. Uh, they're not all bad. And all the really, really good ones who are really about their business. Uh, they're about customer service. They're about customer satisfaction uh, and so on. So I want to make sure I say that up front. However, there are some ones which, uh, let's just say, aren't the greatest. And it can be very stressful. And uh, I've had my fair share of uh, dealing with these kind of guys. And I've got the gray hairs, as you can see, to, uh, to prove it. And uh, you know the deal. Uh, guys that show up there. And uh, a task that you think is pretty straightforward becomes a nightmare scenario. Uh, everything's going wrong. Uh, you know, they start the work, they don't finish, they don't show up. They, you know, if, if they do show up, they show up drunk. Uh, all they want is money, 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 money. And, uh, you know, it, it's just, it can be very, very stressful. And it can be very expensive as well. And, uh, and so what I want to do here is kind of give some tips to avoid uh, some of those uh, headaches and uh, unfortunate situations. This is a lot of it's based on my experience. Um, you know, uh, had experience with all different types of things. So we're going to cover about 17 different tips I'm going to cover today. Uh, I'm going to try and do as much as I can. It's about 17 of them. They run the gamut. And so let's let's get the show on the road. And the first tip is, uh, you know, know what you want before you get estimates. You know, uh, I tell people the first thing you want to do is to get a good idea of what exactly it is that you want from this project, which means that you need to develop what I call a scope of work. A scope of work is explains in detail uh, what it is that, uh, you know, is uh, you're expecting the contractor to provide. Uh, I like to go room by room. So I go through a room in the living room. What do we want in the living room? We want this done, this done, this done. In the dining room, what do we want? We want this done, this done, this done. The kitchen, what do we want? This done. So, you know, essentially you're walking through the house and you're developing a, a good idea of what it is that you want within the scope of work. Now that you have that, uh, you know, you can then start, uh, you know, talking to contractors because uh, you have a pretty good idea of what it is that you want rather than the other way around, which is to go contact contractors and asking them for ideas. And, uh, and so, you know, uh, you know, that can be very tricky. So what my, my the first tip is know what you want before you get, um, you know, estimates and or you start even speaking to contractors. Tip number two 
is ask other investors, friends, associates, relatives, co-workers for references. You know, I mean, there are people who have some very positive experiences. Uh, other investors, you can go to RIA meetings. Uh, you can go to, um, you know, go to the Home Depot, Lowe's, uh, ask them if they can re refer some good contractors to you. Uh, they're usually pretty good, uh, especially the pro desks. Uh, they have a lot of good experiences with different kind of contractors. And uh, what you could do, in fact, is go there early, maybe six or seven o'clock in the morning. Um, you know, good contractors tend to get to the, the stores early before the rush comes. And uh, so they can get out to the job site early in the morning. So if you want to go down to the Home Depot Lowe's in the morning early around six or seven o'clock and speak to the pro desk, they can usually give you some recommendations. You know, people in the neighborhood uh, can sometimes give you a recommendation. Or, um, you know, if you know some friends in the business, they can also give you some recommendations as well. So ask other people for referrals and references is the second tip here. The third tip is to interview at least three or more contractors uh, before you get the job done, okay? Well, at least before you start. So, you know, you want to kind of uh, ask, uh, you know, ask the contractors or ask the people, the referrals, I suppose, uh, you know, what they did, uh, how was the experience, uh, did they, uh, what did they like, what they did not like, uh, ask a lot of questions. And, uh, you know, interview, when you interview with these, you know, um, find out more about them. You know, uh, ask a lot of questions about uh, the proposal that they're going to give you. How do they like to work? Uh, do they, is it mainly uh, materials only? Uh, and, you know, or is it labor only? And then you pay for the materials? Or is the price going to be inclusive of labor materials? Uh, you know, have a, you know, I'm a firm believer sometimes when you speak to somebody, you have a pretty good idea whether, you know, uh, the vibes are there and uh, whether you feel that, uh, you know, there's a connection. And this is the kind of person you want to do business with. Um, also, you educate yourself because they're probably going to be asking you questions uh, about what it is that you want and trying to make sure that they understand exactly what it is that you're looking for such that everyone's on the same page. So ask and interview uh, several contractors uh, before you make a decision. You really don't want to go with uh, just one. Uh, sometimes, uh, you know, you'll get one and... Uh, yeah. Yeah, you, you, it's just especially if you're starting out, uh, you want to be able to compare uh, at least two or three estimates and uh, and then make a decision. Now, uh, with that said, you don't always want to go with the cheapest guy. Uh, the cheapest guy is not always the best guy. Sometimes you get what you pay for, as they say. And um, you know, if you got one estimate for fifty thousand, another one for fifty five thousand, another one for thirty five thousand. You know, you may think, wow, if I use the 35,000 guy, I'll quote unquote save 15,000 bucks or 20,000 bucks. Uh, well, yeah, maybe, but maybe not. Sometimes the cheap guy is just trying to get in the door and then they'll make, make up the difference later on once the project starts. Or they realize they're not going to make any money, so they run away and uh, leave you high and dry. So sometimes the cheapest guy is not always the best guys, but uh, try and get several estimates. And, uh, and then make a decision uh, accordingly. Now, obviously, you want to compare apples with apples. And that's the reason why you want to make sure you have a good scope of work. And that way, when they provide you with their uh, estimates, you're able to compare like with like. Uh, another thing is to be realistic about availability. Uh, sometimes not all contracts can start straight away, uh, especially if the contract is real good. They've probably got other projects going on. So you want to find out, um, you know, when can they start? And, uh, you know, is that okay with you? It could be a few days. It could be a few weeks. It could be a few months. Just depend on their, their availability. So you want to make sure you're on the same page in terms of when they can start and versus how long you want to wait and when you want the project to start as well. And uh, you can ask them how many projects that you got going on. And uh, so this is important because sometimes if they've got too many projects going on, then it means that, uh, you know, they're, they're stretched thin, which means that they may not be able to devote as much time to your project as, uh, as if they could if they uh, maybe didn't have so many projects. So the availability and their uh, ability, I suppose, to work on your project full time is something that you want to consider as well. 
Uh, next thing you want to ask for is uh, uh, ask, uh, you know, how much of the work will be done by subcontractors uh, versus them? Uh, some, I mean, I know my contractors, they use, uh, you know, they have subs for electricians, plumbers, and HVAC people. They're part of the same group, uh, but uh, they use subcontractors and uh, for those particular trades. So you want to know, uh, you know, are they going to be using subcontractors? If so, uh, what type, what trades, uh, what parts of the project will they be, uh, you know, using them? And is it for the electrical? Is it for the plumbing? Is it for the detailed carpentry? Is it for the roof? I mean, what's, what are they using um, subcontractors for? Again, there's nothing wrong with subcontractors. It just means that there's other people that hopefully your contract is going to be managing. And if there's a dispute, you want to make sure that you know who the subcontractors are. Because if, if the main contractor doesn't pay the subcontractors, then technically the subcontractors could put a lien against your house, what we call a mechanics lien. So you want to know who the subcontractors are, what their roles is going to be, and uh, who's going to be overseeing and managing them as part of the project. And uh, number six, choose the right contractor for the right project. Uh, you know, just because you got a guy can paint uh, a carpet, you know, just to paint the house doesn't necessarily mean that he can do a rehab project. Um, you know, it's, uh, it's different skill sets, different trades. And, uh, and so you want to make sure that you've got the right person, uh, doing the right task. And, uh, so, uh, you know, so you want to kind of make sure that their specialties and you don't want to be the guinea pig for the, you know, let's say that, that they're good at painting and, uh, they may not do drywall but your project includes drywall. And they say, yeah, yeah, we can do it, and I'll be doing it. And so essentially, uh, you're going to be the guinea pig for his drywall experience. Uh, that may be okay for you because he may give you a good deal. But uh, again, you want to make sure that you pick the right person for the right trade. You don't want to get a plumber who knows a little bit about electrical do if it's a major electrical project and vice versa. You want to make sure you get the right people uh, for the right task. I'm uh, moving along here. Hopefully, uh, this is good stuff. And uh, next thing you want to do is uh, another tip is to check uh, licenses and complaints and uh, if there's any litigation uh, history of, of this person. Uh, check licenses because, um, you know, you really should be working with licensed people, people who are legit, people who have been sanctioned by the state. And uh, there is some, uh, you know, you know, you have some sort of uh, recourse if something goes wrong. And uh, you know, and and that's the that's the that's really the advantage of using licensed people, and is that there's some recourse that you have if there's a dispute, and uh, and so on. So you want to know, uh, you want to check the licenses if they have licenses. Sometimes that may not be a problem for you. Uh, depend on the scope of the, the scope of the project itself, and uh, obviously the licensing varies by municipality. So one state, one municipality may have different rules and requirements as it pertains to licenses uh, versus another one. Uh, you want to check any disciplinary records that's taken place. Uh, may want to check the Better Business Bureau or uh, local local courts uh, to see if that uh, they've been sued. Uh, I know one guy. Oh my goodness, he's a, he's a character. He just goes from one project. He gets he takes advantage of the customers, then uh, they go after him, and then he just changes names and does it again to somebody else. He's, you know, it's it's just a terrible experience for a lot of these clients. So you want to kind of uh, uh, check the court records and see if there's been any litigation against this uh, these people, or this person, or this company, and uh, and so on. Which kind of uh, leans into um, you know number eight, which is to check uh, the references. Uh, obviously, they're probably going to give you uh, people who they're going to get glowing uh, references for. I assume they're not going to give you ones that's going to trash them. And so you want to check the references and ask questions from the uh, refer references uh, people of reference. And, uh, you know, ask things like, uh, how, was, how was their experience? 
how close did they, uh, with well, the final uh, dollar amount, come to the estimate? What are the issues? What are the challenges they experienced? Um, you know, the quality of the workmanship. Uh, were they uh, timely? And uh, and so on. So there's a lot of questions. Maybe you can have photographs or even go visit them to uh, to see uh, and check the quality of the workmanship uh, that was took place as, uh, uh, at these different projects. Uh, and uh, if you can see the finished product, that's even better as well. And uh, and so on. So I've given you so far eight tips. Let me just quickly run through them again. Number one, know what you want before you get estimates. So make sure that you, uh, you're you clear in your mind what it is that you want from the scope of work. Uh, number two, ask other investors and relatives, friends, co-workers for references. Number three, uh, interview at least three contractors before you select somebody. Uh, I strongly recommend that uh, you try to get three, definitely try and get at least two uh, rather than just one. Uh, be realistic about their availability. Not all, if they're, if they're good, they probably can't, they may not be able to start the project straight away. So, uh, you know, to them, press them too hard in the sense that you want them to start right now because they may not be ready. If, the, if you force them to start, then the chance, especially before they finish another project, is that they may be stretching themselves too thin and therefore, uh, you know, uh, they'll be working part time in your job and another job as well. Uh, you know, the role of the subcontractors that they use, how much of the work will be done by subcontractors, what trades, what professions, make sure that you know that so that you can get um, uh, what we call mechanics, uh, lean releases. That's, that's it, lean releases, um, you know, when the project's finished. So that way you don't have subcontractors potentially pull a lien on against you or your property. Number six, choose the right contract for the right project. You want to make sure that uh, the person that you're using is qualified and skilled and able to do the particular job that you're doing. You don't want an electrician to do plumbing work. You don't want a HVAC guy to be doing electrical work and so forth and so on. Uh, you don't want, you know, you got to be careful about, uh, you know, making sure you get the right person to do the right job. Sometimes people are, are just over their head. And once they get over their head, um, you know, they're more likely to just walk off uh, because they know that they can't finish and they'll leave you high and dry. Number seven, check licenses uh, for complaints, history, litigations against this uh, this company. Make sure that, uh, you know, uh, no one's chasing them. They don't owe people money. They have good records in the Better, Bu better Business Bureaus and uh, make sure that they have the right licenses for what it is that you want to do. I do recommend that you try to use licensed uh, contractors if possible. You don't have to, but there are there is a certain level of recourse that you have with uh, uh, licensed contractors that you don't have with unlicensed contractors. Uh, number eight is to check references, um, you know, and, uh, and, and you know, ask questions from the people and were they happy with the workmanship, the quality, timeliness. And uh, did they finish on time? Did they, uh, was it a pleasant experience? Will they recommend them and so on? So check references, references ask a lot of questions. Okay, we're kind of midway through. Uh, again, you see the little scrolling thing. I do have a network event uh, June the 17th, which is this Saturday between 11 a.m. and 1 p.m. It is invitation only. I don't, I think there may be one or two seats left, uh, but you can shoot me an email, joe at joeasimo.com. And for more information, I'll send you an invitation or invite. It is invitation only, so you must attend with an invitation. Uh, so shoot me an email at joe at joeasimo.com. And, uh, and if there are seats available, I'll shoot you and I'll send you an invite. And uh, it's going to be a great time. We've been networking in person at one of my project properties in Washington, D.C. It's in the Hate Street Corridor. Uh, also, it's, I think it's a time, a good time to... Uh, to connect with like-minded investors, and uh, we haven't—I haven't done this for a little while. I thought I'll do it. It's free, uh, no hidden agendas. I'm not selling anything. I just feel that uh, it's time for us to kind of network and uh, and talk shop, as they say. Okay, so we're going to do a Q and A session very shortly. So enter your question in the chat box, and uh, I'll try to get to them uh, shortly. Number nine. Let's have a look. What time do it? Nine. Oh gosh, I've got to rush this one. Read online reviews, uh, you know, things like Angie's List, Home Advisors, Yelp, Google, uh, and so on to see if uh, what kind of reviews that they've had from past, past 
customers. Uh, they may, if they've had one bad review, that's okay. Sometimes you always get a disgruntled person, but it's sometimes useful to check, uh, see if there's any uh, positive or negative reviews about this person or this company. Uh, number nine, number 10, sorry, is to make sure that you sign a detailed contract. Uh, contracts that uh, kind of uh, address things like the deadlines, payment schedules, uh, the materials that's going to be used, who will provide the materials, is it you, is it them? The roles and responsibilities of the contractor, of the subcontractors. And uh, I, I do believe in a detailed contract as opposed to one of those back of the nap napkin things because uh, things do happen, things do go wrong. And if you've got a detailed contract, then it should address most of the issues. Um, you know, what happens about scope, scope creep? And, um, you know, what happens if you knock down a wall and then uh, you find out there's stuff there that you didn't know? Uh, what happens then? Who's responsible for that? Uh, how do you deal with situations like that? And uh, so how do you address what we call change orders? Uh, and, uh, yeah, that could be real tricky, especially if the cheap guys who come in, uh, underbid the project, and uh, just to get in. And everything, every time something goes wrong, they say, well, it's not part of the scope. It's outside the scope. And then they want more money. They want more money, want more money. And uh, in fact, that's how I met my current contractors, the one I've used for about the last eight years. Uh, I had a contractor I was using. And uh, every time he, you know, he wanted something done, he just says, it's outside the scope. He needs more money. He needs more money. He needs more money. Up to the point where but I was tired. And uh, found out that uh, I was paying him, but he wasn't paying his subcontractors. Horrible experience. Okay, number 11. Uh, make sure you get the proper permits. Uh, most of the projects, um, you know, that at least I deal with, and I'm sure a lot of you will be dealing with, will require permits. Um, you know, be careful of, of contractors saying, well, we don't need permits for this thing. Or let's, yeah, I know we need permits, but we'll just, do without it and see what happens. Be careful uh, because uh, if you don't have the right permits and the inspectors come, <clears throat> um, it can give you a lot of problems. You can get what we call a uh, stop work order and uh, you have to pay fines and then you have to pay, get the right permits and then there's delays and it, it's a horrible experience to, 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 um, you know, to have a stop work. I have fortunately never had that experience. I know when I first started, I really didn't know what I was doing. Uh, so I may have had some projects where I didn't use permits, uh, you know, but in hindsight, I look back and say, no, nah, probably the best thing to do is just get the right permits in place and make sure everything's inspected properly. Uh, and that way, you know, you, you limit your exposure, you limit your liability if something was to go wrong, uh, you know, later on. So, uh, you know, make sure you, uh, you know, speak to the contractor to understand what permits are needed. And make sure you get the right permits for the job. Uh, number number twelve is don't pay more than ten percent. I think we've got a lot. Oh my goodness, we've got a lot of questions here. So I'm going to go to Q and A very shortly. Don't pay more than ten percent of the total job start. So that's pretty self-explanatory. Uh, you know, be careful of the contract to say you know I need fifty percent or thirty percent up front, and uh, and so on because they could take that thirty percent, fifty percent, and run off with your money and never you never see them again. So I would not recommend you pay more than ten percent up front. And uh, that way you can also, uh, what's it called, uh, connect the, the payments to milestones. So if this is done, you get paid. If this is done, you get paid and so forth and so on. Number 13, uh, budget for unexpected costs. Uh, I've never done a project that came under budget. All my projects, for whatever reason, three things always happen. One. Uh, always cost more than what you think. Two, you always have problems with the contractors. And three, it always takes longer than what you think it's going to be. Uh, that's just the way it is. But, uh, but make sure that you, you have a buffer, uh, you know, for unexpected, uh, you know, occurrences. Uh, typically, they like to have a 10% or 15% overage uh, from, you know, for unknowns. Uh, so set that aside because there will be some cases whereby uh, you'll have some unknown expenses that you're going to have to, uh, you know, deal with. Uh, number 13, negotiate the 14, sorry, negotiate the ground rules, you know, before you start the project in terms of what hours a, a contract is going to work, what kind of notice you're going to get from the contractors, change orders, how you're going to handle that. 
how you're going to handle disputes, dispute resolutions. Where will they park their vehicles? Uh, what will you know? Will they be cleaning up after themselves each day? I mean, there's a lot of things that you. you know, how many people are going to be working on your site each day? These are some of the things that you want to negotiate on the ground rules. Uh, you don't want to go to the site and then you find out no one's there, or you find out that uh, you know um, it's not moving along the way you want it to go, and so on. So that's number fourteen. Number fifteen is talk to the contractors frequently. I meet with my contract usually once a week. Uh, you know, that way, if there's a problem, you can catch it earlier on. Um, you know, typically when they meet, we meet at my home and, uh, you know, we have food, a uh, little, you know, social and, uh, you know, just kind of catch up and then we then talk business. So you want to have a good relationship with your contractors. If you do, then, uh, you know, they look out for you and hopefully you look out for them by paying them on time and, and don't nickel and dime them to death. Uh, so, uh, you know, it's always good to have frequent updates from your, um, from your contractors. And you can definitely do that if you meet with them on a regular basis. Number 16 is get a lean release, uh, after the project's finished. Uh, I, I talked to you about earlier on about, uh, if you're not careful, uh, if you don't pay the contractor or the subcontractors, they can put a lien against your house, what we call a mechanics lien. And uh, which means that uh, you won't be able to sell or you won't be able to refinance your house until that lien is taken care of. So uh, what we call a lien release is what we ask typically of them uh, once the project's finished. And uh, number 17, the final one, don't make the final payment until the job is 100% complete. And uh, because once you've paid the last draw, you know, you're not going to see them again um, or it's going to be very difficult for them to come off to get them to come back if something's not right. So the bottom line is this, you know, uh, it's not easy. There are a lot of good contracts out here, but it's uh, it's your responsibility to make sure you select the right contractor. It's your responsibility to manage that relationship with a contractor, uh, have the right paperwork in place, have the right scope of working place make sure that you have uh, a good working relationship with them and uh and really address payment issues uh dispute issues and um you know just uh, hopefully be a partnership uh don't nickel and dime them to death work with them and uh, you'll be fine so by going through the 17 tips i've just given you uh, i know i put out a lot of stuff here uh that hopefully that'll make your experience with your contractors a lot uh you know pleasant one and without a whole lot of problems and uh you know hopefully the information i've shared with you uh, has been helpful so that is it my friends i'm gonna go to the the q a session and uh again uh for those so if you've got questions put enter your questions in the chat box and finally uh as i said before i do have a networking event this saturday june the 17th uh, between uh, 11 a.m. and 1 p.m. in Washington, D.C., at one of my houses in the Northeast Washington in the H Street Corridor. If you're in the D.C. area, you want to network, uh, meet with me, meet with other like-minded people, shoot me an email at joe at joeasimo.com, joe at joeasimo.com for more information, and I'll send you an email with an invite. I think we may have one or two slots left, and but it is purely invitation only. Don't just show up at the door. Okay, let's go to comments, and uh, I'm going to see if I can try to get some of these answers let's have a look what we have here good evening hey how's it going marlon hope you i'm glad that you've been able to join us hope you're having a good day i hope i'll see you on saturday hey james hope you're doing well and uh hope you're doing good hey <laughs> hi brian the king of buy and hold <laughs> oh is that me or are you referring to me or are you referring to yourself hopefully you heard to me uh but brian's a great contractor I know I gave him a hard time. Uh, what's it called? Uh, he's he's one of the good guys. And, uh, you know, he's very, very knowledgeable. He does a lot of work in the Washington, D.C. area. I highly recommend uh, if you can connect with Brian. He's a good guy. And uh, and so on. Hi, Brian. Hopefully, you, if you've got some time, feel free to uh, come over on Saturday if you're interested. And uh, and so on. Leave your comments for the Q&A sessions. Ask any questions you have, and I will gladly answer. That's from me, yes. And uh, this is the link for registering. For the network event, it's uh, eventbrite.com. Oh, my goodness. It's a long one. And the easiest way is just to send me your human email, and I will send it to you because I feel that this is a very long email. It's eventbrite, 
uh real estate networking meetup tickets 642 <laughs> it's a long one so anyway just shoot me an email i'll send you a link and we'll be good to go uh Dr. good evening dr joe how are you doing uh Dow two. I spoke to another, this is from Marlon. I spoke to another investor over the weekend and was talking about overdue water bills. How do you handle this with your tenants? Uh, yeah, so most of my tenants, uh, they are responsible for utilities. And uh, I don't pay any utilities, electric, gas, and water. In this case, from Marlon, uh, the, he has a tenant who has an overdue water bill. Depending on how much it is, I will definitely uh, contact the tenant, give him a heads up that the payment has to be made. And, uh, you know, uh, well, first thing is I make sure that I get a copy of the water bill so you can sign up for the water bill copy, a duplicate copy, and you'll get notified. And uh, if the tenants aren't paying, then you, it's your responsibility to contact the tenant to try to get them to pay. Now, uh, water is very different than electric and gas. Water stays with the house, which means that if the tenant doesn't pay the water bill, then, it, you know, it's ultimately it's your responsibility. So it's something that you want to make sure it doesn't get too, um, you know, too uh, high. Now, uh, depending on what, what jurisdiction you're in, if you're in Washington, D.C., there's a lot of good programs out there that do assist uh, with the water bill. So if you've got a tenant who's uh, having difficulty paying, uh, you may want to uh, reach out to some of these organizations that's out there, and uh, they may be able to provide some funds to assist the tenant bring the um, the bill back to current. Otherwise, the tenant can call the water company and establish what we call a payment plan. And so that way the water can be paid off. But yeah, that's that's one of the bills that you want to keep track of. Uh, in fact, I have one of my assistants, uh, you know, little, um, this is an advanced tip. Uh, I have one of my assistants who, uh, her job is to find out all these different programs out there and uh, for utility assistance, rental assistance, and so forth. So that way, when if and when my tenants run into a problem, uh, we're able to reach out to them and try and help the tenant. Uh, it's cheaper to work with the tenant than it, has, than it is to evict the tenant. And so I place a lot of uh, emphasis on uh, customer service, and that's what I do here. Good question, Marlon. Uh, Johnny H., uh, save me a seat, Dr. Joe. Okay, how you doing, Johnny? Shoot me an email, joe at joeasimo.com. And uh, I will send you an invite. Uh, again, it, you're going to have to do it real fast because I don't know how many seats are left. Uh, but uh, Joe, Joe Asimo, shoot me an email. Okay, Dow 2. I was thinking about building a house on an empty lot. Oh, my goodness. You're very, very adventurous. There used to be a home there, but it burnt down. Okay. The debris has been removed. Do you think I should try to hire an existing home builder? Or do you think I should hire... A general contractor and high subs. This home is in a subdivision, so it should be I pick a house. It show, so it should be I pick a house. This home will be built from scratch. Okay, so um, uh, Dao Tu's uh, scenario is that he's got an empty lot. He's found an empty lot, and this house is burnt down. And uh, he wants to know he wants to build a new 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 job on a new house on this uh, empty lot. So what should he do? Um, I don't typically uh, build from scratch. I usually take houses that are already standing and I rehab the interior as opposed to start from scratch. So I'm not really the best person for this uh, question to, to provide you. But typically I would go with somebody. I would go to a local RIA in your area. And there's probably uh, investors here who do what we call uh, you know, ground up construction. And uh, they're very experienced. And uh, they know the pros and cons, what to do, um, you know, uh, how to navigate the, you know, the local government uh, bureaucratic process and, uh, and so on. So um, I would ask them and see what they say. Uh, but generally, I would say you hire somebody who has experienced either a, uh, a builder or a GC and, uh, and let them, you know, uh, get the subs as opposed to you get the GC and then you find, uh, you know, the subs separately. Uh, I would just probably go with a GC who can do the whole work, who the whole job uh, and so on. But uh, but I think a better answer would be probably go to a local RIA or speak to other investors that do ground up construction 
um, because that's not really my, uh, you know, my area of strength there. But hopefully I was helpful. Uh, Lauren Davila, thanks, Joe. Hope you're doing well. I'm doing extremely well, Lauren. And uh, again, hopefully if you're in the D.C. area, you can come along on Saturday. And uh, hey, cool, John. Uh, let's have a look. How many questions we have left? We've got a few more. 7.38. I'm going to have to wrap it up a bit. Uh, hey, good evening, Joe. I have a house in potentially looking to purchase. I have a house in potentially looking to, and I have a Joe. I have a house. Okay, and in potentially looking to purchase three bedroom, but has the potential for two more rooms in the basement. Okay, but I can't find any information on how much Section Eight would pay. Uh, de- cool, John. It depends on your jurisdiction where you live. Um, you know, many times the housing authorities they uh, advertise locally. Uh, on their websites, uh, how much they pay for a one, two, three, four, five bedrooms. And uh, based on that, you will then have an, a good idea of how much you can possibly get. Uh, now, for those people in Washington, D.C., I know Washington, D.C. Housing Authority, they've changed things around uh, come July the 1st. So there's a little bit of gray area here. I mean, I mean I've mean, i been do- dealing with these guys for the last 30 years, so I, I have an idea how this is going to shake out. I've got my thoughts. Maybe I'll talk about that on Saturday. And uh, but I'm not really that concerned. I'm not really that worried, um, you know, and uh, but I'll give you my reasons on Saturday if you're able to come. But, yeah, you want to call the local housing authorities and uh, find out how much they pay. Uh, and then you can have to do the numbers to see if it's worthwhile uh, to uh, how much it's going to cost to get two extra bedrooms versus how much extra rent you can achieve. Good questions. Uh, Johnny H, if you find a good potential voucher tenant. But they don't have money for the security deposit. What do you do? Uh, there are again, there are organizations, Johnny, uh, where you can assist with security deposits. Um, there's quite a few of them in Washington. If you're in Washington, D.C., uh, that are out there. Uh, so again, I'll talk about that on Saturday. But you may want to do a research, uh, do a Google search on uh, rental assistance programs. Uh, or you know, um, I know that uh, what's it called? Uh, if, it, if it's in Washington, D.C., uh, Greater Washington Urban League helps, and a few other people helps with security deposits. Uh, hopefully that was helpful, Johnny. Uh, Dow 2, second question, is it is it customary for it to take 60 days for housing to send the HAP contract? This is how long it took me to receive mine. This is my first HAP contract, so I'm trying to understand. Um, thanks. Okay. Uh, it depends, what again, what, what jurisdiction you're in, uh, Dow 2. Now, too, uh, if you're in Washington, D.C., it shouldn't normally. Uh, the way it works is that uh, you find a tenant and they send you a, a HAP contract. Uh, you know, typically you you sign the new re- lease with a tenant. Once you sign the new lease with a tenant, you then send the documents, the lease to the uh, housing authority. They will then send you the HAP contract and uh, you fill it out, send it back in. Normally, it should be about 15. If it's in Washington, D.C., you should get paid within 15 minutes, 15 minutes, 15 days. If not, it'll be the next month. Uh, you should get that. It should be within 30 days. 60 days seems a little excessive for me. I'm not too sure why. Uh, I don't know where you are, what uh, what jurisdiction or housing authority you're using. But uh, if it is 60 days, then it is what it is. But I know that in the Washington, D.C. area, it's typically it's really between 15 and 30 days. Uh, and so on. So, we'll, oh my goodness, got so many questions. Uh, does housing determine the rent amount for the number of bedrooms or from the number of people? The number of bedrooms. Uh, so, the number of bedrooms is what determines uh, the rent that you'll get, not so much the number of people. Number of people will determine the vouchers size that they'll get. And uh, so, depending on how many people in the household, it could be one, two, three, four, five bedrooms vouchers. And uh, um, then that voucher holder will have, let's say a voucher holder has a four bedroom voucher and then you have a four bedroom house, then they can move in there without a problem. If you have a four bedroom house, if you have a five bedroom house and you rent it to a four bedroom voucher holder, you probably will not get the five bedroom rate. You'll get the four bedroom rate because the voucher holder is only qualified for four bedrooms. Okay. So if you got a five bedroom house, I recommend that you get a full, a five bedroom voucher holder if you want the five bedroom rent if you got a four bedroom house i suggest you get a four bedroom voucher holder 
if you want the four bedroom rent. Now you could have a four bedroom house and you rent it to a five bedroom voucher holder. You still get the four bedroom rent. Uh, if the five bedroom voucher holder can quote unquote downgrade to a four bedroom uh, if necessary. Okay. How long does a typical rehab take? It depends on the scope of work, James. Uh, mine usually take between three to four, five months uh, because I have pretty major rehabs. Uh, typically, uh, it's a gut level rehab. We're doing everything new, new systems. We usually gut it out down to the, the studs and then we pretty much start from there. Uh, on bills from scratch, I'm, I'm going to have to wrap this up because it's 7.43. I know that uh, uh, on bills from scratch is the rule of thumb: should the building be based on the price per square foot of the house if I am not doing any expensive upgrades? That's true. Some people do price per square foot. Uh, I just like to develop a scope of work and then give it to a contractor or several contractors and get bids. Uh, and then sort of, uh, or you can go to some online sites where, you know, they can give you some sort of uh, ballpark estimates of what certain types of jobs would cost. James, I'll be there on Saturday. I went there last Saturday, not realizing it would be this Saturday. It was a good trip. I found a nice street parking spot. Okay, well, I will see you on Saturday. I'm not too sure if you, well, how you got the place because, uh, you shouldn't have got the address, but but anyway, uh, but I'll be there on Saturday. So shoot me an email again, uh, Saturday, uh, between 11 and 1 PM, uh, shoot me an email at joe at joeasimo.com. Uh, it's a networking event and uh, it's going to be great. Uh, one of my houses, we're going to network, meet with other like-minded investors and just kind of catch up everybody and, uh, network. And I hopefully get a chance to meet with you. And you'll get a chance to meet with me and you'll get a chance to meet with other investors. So with that said and done, my friends, I will see you on Saturday. And uh, otherwise, I'll see you next week. In fact, I'm going to um, Mexico in a couple of weeks. Uh, a good friend of mine, Andre, is getting married and he invited us over to the wedding. So I'll be going to Mexico. Yay. And for a few days and uh, wish him, uh, you know, congratulations, uh, Andre and Dawn. I look forward to seeing you in a couple of weeks. And, uh, and then after that, we're going to London, if all goes well, in early January, uh, January, July, and uh, mid-July, sorry, for uh, probably another week or two over there in London. So uh, my goal is to do four countries every year, and this will make it four countries this year. Thank you, guys. I'll see you all next week. Otherwise, next Wednesday, Wealth Wednesday, 7 p.m. Eastern Time. Don't forget, Saturday, shoot me an email, Joe at Joe Asimo, if you want to come to an event. Thanks, all. Take care. Bye for now.